Hello. I think everybody can hear me, although because this is a webinar, the only the other moderators and presenters are, are able to talk. So we'll get this figured out. We're still a little bit early. We've got three minutes to six. I'm going to turn my camera off now and just talk uh, amongst the, the presenters just to make sure that we uh, all are able to connect and we'll allow others to join. But uh, thanks for hanging on the line. It looks like we already have a good number of us here. Perfect. Great. It's coming through. Okay. Uh, so as I said, we do want to wait for others to join, but maybe uh, we could just talk uh, amongst ourselves and kind of meet uh, the presenters again. I kind of wish that I could open it up to everybody to talk amongst themselves, but it's just a bit of, it's a bit challenging to manage that. Um, so I hope you understand. One of the things that I will say, I'm just going to share my screen actually before I uh, introduce myself to uh, to Sohil here because I can see his face is that uh, you all should be on the Slack channel. Now I've been talking about the Slack channel a lot uh, at the in-person meetups lately, but if you don't uh, if you don't know what that is, um, this Slack screen that I'm sharing this is possible to get to by going to Calgary.ai, which is the homepage for the meetup and you can register and that's just a couple steps that will get you onto the slack channel we'll take questions here on the slack as well as on zoom mm -hmm. and of course throughout the month if you wanted to communicate with me or with each other on the slack it's something that's available no matter what's going on in the in the in the world right um so i'm going to share uh, just one more screen and then we'll just chat amongst the presenters for a sec so that other screen is just the um the home page of the um, of the meetup, uh, which is right here, you can get to the Slack workspace by clicking this link. So I thought I would make a you know a, a nice slide to show this off, but really I think the best thing to do is just to go to Calgary.ai or Meetup.com/Calgary-AI and just click that link, get on the Slack. You'll see this registration page, and that'll get you through, and then you'll be able to talk virtually. So, without further ado. It's nice to uh, meet you, uh, Sohil. How do you uh, pronounce your name? I want to make sure I've got that correctly. That's that's perfect, Sohil. And it's nice to meet you guys too. Sohil, thanks for jumping on. And we have Yannick, I see, just joined as well, although I'm not sure that uh, uh, we have a mic connected up yet. Omaladi, I know you're back there somewhere as well. So I think a uh, big thank you to IBM for rallying and kind of continuing to provide great content here. I know um, we uh, really appreciate it. And if we were in person, we would really appreciate the, the uh, snacks and the um, sandwiches and, and all the stuff you've done for us lately. So, you know, so Hill, I think I'll maybe just kick it over to you now. We're at the top of the hour. We did say six o'clock and it's been open now for a few minutes. So maybe um i wouldn't dive into it right off the right off the bat uh, if you can kind of let you know i'm assuming we'll have people trickling in for the next five minutes or so but uh, okay. i do want to kind of stick to the time that we'd set so it's now six o'clock so welcome everybody and uh, so he'll over to you thanks Thank you. Uh, are we live now we are okay okay great thanks uh, uh th thank you for organizing uh these talks and um and hello to everyone. Um, uh, I was really hoping to meet everyone in person, uh, but uh, I guess um, this COVID-19 is, is the issue now. Um, I hope everyone is safe. Um, um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen here. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, do you see my screen? Not yet, so here. Yeah, I don't see a screen yet, but mm -hmm. if you um, if you try one more time, uh, I did. I don't think I got a notification to allow you to present. Uh, if that was the blocker, um, I don't think I saw it. So maybe go ahead and try again. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, it's blocking my yeah, screen. I, so I have just confirmed in the settings here that that all the panelists can share. So I believe you should be able to share. Okay, perfect. Um, It's asking me to shut down PowerPoint and open it again. Sorry, guys. Uh, do you see my screen now? Nothing yet. No. no. I'm sure, we'll get it figured out. Does it? It does it say you're sharing or? You know what we could do is maybe have one of your colleagues attempt yeah. to share. You know, maybe Omalade, if you could try to share, just to narrow down the problem. All right, great. Uh, so, help can you just flag it to me? You have the latest version, right? Um. I, I really apologize, guys. It's asking me to quit the um, Zoom. Um, yeah. I will come back in a second. Yeah, so Hill, can you slot the latest version to me and I can try from here? Um, Just to try the audio, can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay, perfect. Can, can, can you hear me too? Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, just as loud and clear. Okay. Yeah. I think everybody is, we have a certain amount of patience yeah. anyways. I mean, mm. it's a, it's a whole new world out there. Right. So we'll, we'll get this sorted out and, um, I, we're doing this for the first time. So not the first webinar that's gone slightly awry this week. I can tell you that much. Uh, so Hill, can you hear me so you can start? It's, it's going to be with you in a second, Amaladi. Okay, good. It's taking time. And, you know, maybe uh, while we multitask to figure this out, uh, we, we would love to get an off-the-top introduction. So Amaladi, not, uh, most of our regular attendees certainly know your face. You've been around a long time, but maybe could you just give a quick intro? And then, so Hill, before you, once you do get the slides up, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great as well. Sure, I'm gonna quickly leave and come back if it's okay with you guys. Sure, um, uh, Drew, uh, were you asking me to like introduce myself again or so here? Did I miss the question, Omalati? Yeah, I said, were you asking me to introduce myself or introduce so here? Uh, well, bo both of you, you know, okay. uh, Sohil, I think, uh, is a new face. You've been around a lot, and right. you know, lots of people, but we have new attendees every time. So, um, you know, for that matter, I should probably introduce myself too, but I'll keep that That's quick. True. I'm Drew. Hi, hi, everybody. Oh, hi, Drew. Yeah, and uh, thanks again for joining us. Sorry for the technical difficulties we're having here. Uh, again, uh, I've met like quite a number of people in the community. My name is Samaladi Amisalu. Uh, I, uh, I am an executive data scientist with IBM. I lead a, I'm a data science team uh, based out of Calgary. And uh, we've taken on like uh, a lot of projects and great work and the natural resources uh, I'm in space. I mean, from mining to I mean, oil and gas. And one of the great work is, I mean, something Shohil is going to be talking about uh, today. Shohil is uh, a senior data scientist with us and uh, he's been with IBM now for um, I mean, maybe a little by a year, and he's been doing like a lot of good work. Perfect, thank you. Um, am I sharing the screen now? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay, perfect, perfect. And apologies again, everyone, uh, for the technical difficulties. Uh, so can I start the presentation? Yeah, one thing to note before you begin is that we are seeing the speaker's notes version as opposed to the prison, the, pres the presentation version. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Is this good? That look that looks better. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Perfect. Um, so, um, hello everyone, and uh, again, uh, apologies for the for the delay. Um, I was hoping to meet everyone in person, but uh, we have this uh, COVID nineteen issue. I uh, hope everyone is safe. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Sohel Parsa. Um, my background is in robotics and optimization, and um, I, I finished school in 2013, and um, I, uh, I, I graduated from University of New Brunswick. Uh, after that, for a few years, uh, I have been working in, um, uh, in a startup environment, mostly in Atlantic Canada, and then I moved to Ontario, worked in BlackBerry for a while, and almost a year ago, I joined um, IBM Services in Calgary. Uh, so as you know, IBM Services is a consulting branch of IBM. And uh, what we do, we help um, industries and organizations with uh, de developing AI solutions, software development, um, cloud strategy, uh, migration to cloud, and then diff different services. Um, today, I want to talk about uh, one of the solutions that we develop for one of our clients and basically walk you through all the steps we took uh, from the business development all the way down to the solution development and uh, basically evaluating how this solution is bringing more value to, the, uh, to our client. Now, first, let, let's see what the, what the, what the, what the problem was. Uh, in oil and gas industry, well visitation is an important part of their production. Uh, that means uh, they have a bunch of uh, wells uh, that uh, they may fail, and all these wells are connected to a monitoring system through a sensors. So every morning, the operators, they get a report of all these failed wells that they have to visit. At the same time, when the operator want to plan their day, which wells to visit first, which wells visit second, they have to think about a bunch of other um, uh, problems or a bunch of other criteria. This includes their driving, this includes uh, that the fact that uh, their day is just eight hours, so they need to make the best out of their day. They also have to think about uh, some um, tasks that are called a scheduled tasks. Every wells they have to be, visit, be visited at least once a week uh, because of some safety um, measurements. So operator has to think about all of this and plan their day. And they usually spend something like 40 minutes to one hour every day to plan their day. So our client came to us and said, we are spending a lot of money here. Can IBM help us improving this uh, process and save money? So after spending some time with the client to understand um, how the process works, we have started looking at uh, different data sources and the relevant data sources that have been collected by them, by our client, to help us better understanding the problem and at the same time be able to identify opportunities. One of these data sets that was very great data set in terms of identifying the opportunity was the uh, operator working hours. The plot that you're seeing here is basically visualizing the total hours that the operator has been working per day. And the dash green line is the 8.5 hours, which is the cut of the day. Anything above that is going to be basically overtime. Um, these uh, bar charts have been color coded. And the yellow part is um, one hour that the operator spent pretty much every day to figure out their day. The black part is basically um, non-scheduled task. That means there has been failure for that day and they had to go and visit the wells. The red part is um, a scheduled task. And for the scheduled task, we know about them in advance. We know that this well has to be visited in the next few days. We also have a uh, green and blue parts, which are half a day meetings and they happen every quarter, they are training or safety meetings. 
So this is a schedule. This is a total uh, hours that one operator has been working over two over uh, almost two months. The x axis uh, is the days. And we have been seeing same profile from different operators. So, and this helps us on the understanding and identifying multiple opportunities. Opportunity number one, there are a scheduled tasks that they go above um, eight hours. We can move these tasks to the days that the operators have more free time. And by doing that, we are smoothing this plot and reducing the overtime. We also notice that there is one hour that the operator works every morning to plan their day. And if we have an automated scheduling advisor to plan the day for the operator, they don't need to spend that time and that time will be saved. We also have been noticing that there are days that there is no failure and everything that the operators are doing are the scheduled tasks. And because of that, there is opportunity to move tasks around and free up a day. It's gonna be a free floating day. So the operator can do um, uh, other tasks that is gonna be actually more valuable to the company. These are the main three categories that uh, we identify from the operator working hours. We also look at the GPS data of the trucks of the operator. And by analyzing that and visualizing that, we notice that there is room for improving uh, the driving or optimizing the driving path for the, for the operators. So we identified these opportunities and communicated them with the client. And we wanted to start working on the optimizing the driving path for the operator. But it's a challenging task. What you are looking at here is two oil fields that our client owns. And these are all the wells that the client owns in this area. And the big challenge is here that all these road information, they are private roads. And most of them, they do not exist in Google Map. So if we want to uh, come up with an algorithm that, come, uh, that will calculate the shortest path between these wells, we need to have those informations. And this was the main challenge or main blocker for this project. Uh, we started doing a research and we find data sources that has the GIS data for all these private roads. Uh, and this GIS data is basically line segments and each line has a starting point and end point. And for each of these a starting end point and end point, we have the latitude and longitude. And from there, you can actually compute the distance between this starting point and end point. And the combination of all these will form a road for you. So we, come, we uh, did uh, some engineering work on this, prepared these data. And what we did, we represent these GIS data in a, in a graph format. And the graph format is, a graph network is basically a bunch of nodes and edges. Each of these nodes represent one of these starting point and end point. And the value for these edges, they represent the length of, or, or, or the distance between the, those nodes. Now, later on, if I want to compute the distance or the shortest path from going to, from point A to point A, to point F, I can plot this graph to an optimization algorithm and the optimization algorithm will do the search to find the shortest path and then corresponding, um, and the corresponding uh, distance. So this was a main a blocker for us. Now that I have, now that I have this GIS information, I have been doing a visualization in terms of seeing how it looks like in, in a real map. We have all these black marks are the wells that the client owns in this area. And we have been highlighting the GIS data, all those starting point and end points and their connection here on this map. And we can take a closer look on the precision of this map. So if I want to go from any of these wells to another well, 
I can compute the exact driving distance and from their exact driving time uh, to basically compute the shortest path for going to between bunch of those. So that was one field. Um, this is another field that the client owns. Uh, these, uh, all these black marks are the wells that they own. And all these highlighted blue lines are the roads in this area. And it's a fairly complex um, uh, environment in terms of if you want to calculate the, the shortest path between all these um, points. Again, this is a closer look in terms of seeing the precision. All those um, starting points and end points that we had in the GIS data, they are shown here with these uh, red dots. So each of these red dots is either a starting point or end point that we got from the GIS data. Now, we have, calc we have um, uh, created this map data. So later on, if I want to go from, um, let's say, uh, this uh, black point to the, to the red point, I can compute the exact driving distance. And just to give you an idea about um, how complicated this could be, this is a well field that the client owns. And all these red marks are the wells in this area. Let's say if for today, you want to visit these 10 yellow points. These are 10 wells that have to be visited today. What is the shortest path, shortest driving path between all these wells? This just gives you a, an, an idea about the complexity of this um, problem. Now, we identified opportunities from the data. And we, we tackled the, the obstacles, which mainly was the role. And now, now it's, it's time to do the, the model formulation. And or, or a scheduler, um, we, we came up with a, a scheduling advisor, which is a multi-objective optimization problem. So this a scheduler advisor uh, is going to basically come up with a plan for operator every morning. And this plan is going to be basically a bunch of wells to visit. And the way that this um, optimizer will work or this uh, scheduler will work, it, it will make sure that the plan that it came up with is going to minimize the overtime for the, uh, for the operator. And it's going to actually maximize the value of visits. And at the same time, it makes sure that that plan, it has the minimum driving time. And it gives you the opportunity to free up a day. So this is a multi-objective optimization problem that we define as a scheduling advisor. And I'm going to go through the details of this later. But first, same as all optimization problems um, or optimization algorithm will have uh, optimization, uh, it's going to have optimization variables. In our case, our optimization variables is going to be a vector of ones and zeros. Because every morning, you have a bunch of wells. So the question is, which well to visit, which well not to visit. And that's going to be the output of the optimizer which come up with a bunch of ones and zero. Wherever it creates a one for a well, that means that well is gonna be visited. And whenever it's zero, that means the well is not gonna be visited that day. Later on, I'm gonna talk about this. Uh, this is a binary optimization and we have to improve, we have to modify the algorithm that we want to use for solving this problem. Also, again, same as all optimization problems, we can have a bunch of constraints here. Uh, one constraint that we have defined here is total daily work hours should be less than eight hours because we don't want them to go above eight hours. Above eight hours is gonna be overtime. Now, any other type of um, uh, constraint, depending on constraint from the business, constraint on the drugs, constraint on the people could be added here. This is a general uh, format of our optimization algorithm, which is going to be basically uh, the engine 
of the scheduling advisor. Um, let, let's let's take a look uh, in, into the uh, into the details of each of these um, <clears throat> uh, each of these uh, objectives and what data has to be prepared for them. So we talk about the driving time, and for the driving time, you require to have the map created. Uh, you also need to represent them in a graph network and then have an algorithm that minimizes the path between all the selected points or selected events. Uh, you also have uh, overtime and you want to minimize your overtime. So for minimizing overtime, you need to have an idea of how much roughly it's going to take for the operator to accomplish each task at a certain level. So have an idea about task duration is, is one part of that. You also need to know about your driving time and the combination of those two shouldn't go above eight hours. We will have the value of visits. So each well, there is a production rate associated with each rate. Now the question is, um, should I go to the well that has highest value or maybe it takes a long time to fix that well and, I'm all, and during that time I can fix a bunch of other wells. So these are the steps that you have to take in order to prepare data for each of those objectives. Now, I, I talk about different um, objectives. Let, let's go and take a look at the, at the driving time and the algorithm that has been working, uh, the algorithm that we have been working on for this part. Uh, for driving time or minimizing the driving path, we, we, we represented this map data or the G, this GIS data in a graph network. And the algorithm that we picked uh, for minimizing the shortest path was, um, uh, was uh, oops, sorry. And the algorithm that we picked for minimizing the shortest path was um, ant colony optimization. This is a, this is a, this algorithm is inspired from the, from nature and ants are capable to find the shortest path between their nest and the food source. And the way that they do this is uh, when, when the ants leave their uh, nest, they move in a random direction until they find their food source. And during that time, they deposit a chemical uh, on, on ground called pheromone. And this chemical evaporates over time. Now, when they want to come back from their food source to the nest, there's a higher chance that they pick the path with the highest amount of pheromone. And if you think about three different paths that they have been taking, the shortest path will have a higher density of pheromone. So it's a higher chance for the, for the, um, for the ants to uh, pick up that path. And if you let this algorithm run for a long time, then you was, the, the, it's going to converge to the shortest path. So there has been um, mathematical modeling of this observation, and it has been um, translated to this ant colony optimization. And in this case, uh, we just picked a random 20 points on our, uh, on our field and asked the algorithm to come up with the with the shortest path. So it has a starting point, point one, and it goes to point two, three, and et cetera. Um, so this is the part that we do the minimize, we do the path planning and minimizing the driving path. And then the next part for us is, um, is maximizing the value of visits. So let's say we have a bunch of wells that are failed and we're gonna visit them. Now, as I said, there is a production rate associated with each well, which, which essentially means, means money. So if you have a bunch of wells uh, with a different production rate, are you gonna visit the one with the highest production rate first? Yes or no? But the question here is, what happened to the time that you have to spend at each of those wells? 
Maybe the wells with the highest production rate requires a lot of time to fix that well. However, if you, during that, that time you can go and fix a bunch of other wells that their uh, value or their production rate is less, but the time that is required to fix them is significantly less. So this is one part that the algorithm or the optimization takes care of. Also, when we are at the failed wells, the algorithm check to see if there is any scheduled task for these failed wells for in the next uh, couple of days. And if so, then operator can take care of them when the operator is at that uh, failed well. If that's, and if that happens, then the operator doesn't have to come back to them the same well tomorrow. And that's how their future schedule would be less busy. Now, the, the scheduler takes care of the, the schedule or regulatory task for the next couple of days. But also, the scheduler looks at the neighborhood of the failed wells. So if say this well has been failed and the operator has to visit, in a very close distance to this well is another well that is not failed today, but there is a scheduled task for this well for tomorrow. So if that is the case, when operator fixes this well, then the, then the um, operator can drive for another two or three minutes and do a, a scheduled task uh, that is plan for the neighbor well, so the operator doesn't have to come back to this area again. So the bottom line here is when, when you have a bunch of failed wells, the well with the highest value is not necessarily your to go. The optimization algorithm will make a balance between the value of the well the task duration and the driving time. And the combination of all those will create your eight hours schedule for the day in a way that by end of the day, you will bring back the maximum value to the, uh, to the, um, to the company, the maximum cash flow. So this is the portion that the algorithm takes care of about the value of the visits and of course, over time and so on. Now that we know how each, how each part of this algorithm works, um, let, let's look at the sample of the output of the algorithm. Every morning, the operator will receive a um, bunch of uh, tasks and it, the task is basically a bunch of wells that the operator has to visit and the type of task. And at the same time, the operator receives a, a driving path. Now, what is interesting here, and I have highlighted here, uh, but, but by the way, all these numbers are randomly generated. Um, we see we have a well that is failed, uh, but for the same well, there has been a, a scheduled check that is planned for the next day. So it's asked, so the, the, the advisor will ask the operator to do those at the same time. So it doesn't have to come back today. We also get an input from the operator in terms of the task duration. These task duration, uh, we, we, there, the client has been collecting some data. So we have some, um, we have an idea on how different, uh, how long different tasks is gonna take but we want our database to be statistically more um, robust and more reliable. That's why we ask the operators to collect more data. So this is the output of our, um, of our algorithm. Now, let's answer the most important question. We came up with an uh, advisor that we claimed is gonna save money for our client. But the question is, how do we evaluate this? Uh, it's a very difficult job to evaluate um, the performance of an advisor. If it's a classification, then there are certain ways to, to do the evaluation. If there's prediction, same. However, 
Here we have an advisor that comes up with a schedule. What you see here on the left is a driving, is, is a driving record that we extracted from the GPS data of the, of, the, of the truck of one of these operators. The operator has been visiting uh, 16 wells uh, and the wells have been identified here with a black um, mark. So we pass this to our advisor and ask the advisor to tell us what's the shortest path uh, if you want to come up with a shortest path between these points. And this is, this is what the algorithm has been suggesting. This is the output of ant colony optimization. So it's going to be basically drawing the main driving path between all these wells. Uh, of course, when, when you are here, you have to uh, you have to take this a small road to go visit this wall and come back. But but this is this is the main driving path here. And based on a bunch of analysis we did, we are seeing that between 20 to 25 percent, the total driving time or the driving path will reduce. So this is one option that, that we see that um, is going to help the client in uh, saving money. Also, we have been looking at the data that the client has been collecting. And over past, over a four months time range, we have been seeing that there have been at least 80 days with the two hours average of overtime. And also we have been saying there have been 35 uh, days uh, with, the, uh, with the less than four hours overtime. Now with using our advisor, the we guarantee that there is no overtime. At the same time, there is no day with the less than 6.5 hours. Also, we have been seeing that as an average, operators were visiting 10 volts. Um, with what we are seeing from or from the output of our simulation is, is 12 volts now. Um, a big saving there is that operators spend one hour roughly every morning to figure out their day. Now with having this advisor, um, they don't need to spend that time. Uh, so every morning they receive an email which has the schedule. Uh, now I should acknowledge uh, that we are in a process of taking this to the field and, 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 um, and basically test this uh, and see how it's gonna responding. Um, these are opportunities that we have identified so far. Uh, however, uh, there might be other opportunities that uh, we can add uh, to the to the advisor. Um, I want to, I forgot to mention here that with, with this driving path that you're seeing here on the left, there, there is nothing wrong with this. What we are seeing here from left to right is basically the limitation of human brain. Uh, we, are, we are all living here in Calgary. If I ask you to go and visit 20 different points in the city, pretty much everyone will come up with a different um, path. And the reason is that no one has a, has a basically a bird eye uh, to see what was the, what's, what's the best driving path. So this is, this is the power of the uh, analytics and the, and the optimization that we can add uh, to or client. Um, with that, I think um, 6.36. Um, yes, thank you for listening. Uh, and I'm, I'm happy to get the questions. Thanks, Sohail. That was great. So in between the time that we started that presentation, I did a little bit of research. So I, again, I've not hosted Zoom uh, webinars before, but what I didn't realize is I can actually allow the uh, attendees to uh, to talk. So I thought uh, that I could allow a few of the folks who've asked questions to pose their questions directly. Um, don't wanna put anybody on the spot. I can certainly read the questions too, but I know at least one of the folks here who's asked a question loves to ask questions. And so I'm gonna uh, assume that Alistair's ears are gonna prick up when I allow him to talk. And I think he has a few questions that he would like to ask. And um, 
if uh, Alistair is uh, on the line listening. Alistair, you now have the mic if you want to ask uh, a few of your questions. I know you had two, and then there were a few other questions that came in as well, but we'll start with uh, Alistair's if that's okay. Uh, that's what you get when you're born with the name that starts with an A. Uh, he says he has no mic. Okay, you're off the hook. So Alistair was wondering at the beginning of the talk, uh, you had presented uh, data set for s spanning 67 days. And I think that maybe uh, you had just gone maybe too fast and we weren't able to grasp, but it seemed like you only had data for 37 days of that 67 day span. And Alistair was wondering if there was an explanation for that. Um, yeah. Um, so, so the data here is this is this a question uh, is it related to this slide the room um, so since Alistair doesn't have a mic I'm gonna have to get him to give me a thumbs up on chat um, and he's typing now so he can add a little bit of color here mm. he says yes that that is the slide um, okay so uh, well, here is um, this um, is basically um, Different operators, uh, they have been uh, working for, um, I guess, different uh, time range. Um, so some operators, they work uh, five days and then they take um, a few days off. And then uh, there are fields that uh, there is one operator and there are fields that there are multiple operators uh, for working. So this is just an example of one operator. I mean, we, there have been other operators that have been working for longer period of time and what operators that they have been for less period of time. This is just a purpose of this is just visualizing and uh, showing the concept. Um, what I showed at the, at the very end in terms of the number of working days, um, that was uh, basically um, looking at uh, all the operators and all the data. Uh, this is just for one operator and um, sometimes operators take time off or, or yeah. That, that makes sense. So and then Alistair had a follow-up question that was asked by, uh, by someone else uh, as well, or at least a very similar question. So rather than using that ant colony optimization algorithm, uh, what other alternatives did you consider? And, and Alistair specifically wondered if you'd considered uh, Dijkstra's al algorithm, and then uh, from Stephen Clark, we had what was your optimization algorithm, and then uh, Menon was asking about some specific uh, rules of thumb heuristics to make that ant colony optimization algorithm work better. So I think that there's a few uh, threads there that maybe you could just speak to generally, all related sure, to the process sure. of choosing the algorithm. Sure. So in terms of the algorithm and why we picked this algorithm, uh, we, we did, uh, we did uh, some research. Uh, we, we did some visualization and some investigation on our algorithm and um, on, on, sorry, on, on the possible solution. And, and it turned out that the problem is, is highly nonlinear and that there are a lot of um, local minimums. So we needed a, a, a solid solution. We need a robust solution that makes sure that it finds the area that has the most optimal solution. Uh, so that was, that, was, that was a big challenge. If, if you look at these, uh, uh, these uh, roads here, um, yeah, this, this one. Uh, so the, there are a lot of possible paths that you can take between these uh, those this between these yellow ones, and uh, and uh, the the challenge there is that you may have a you may have a solution and then you create another solution that is a slightly better solution, and then uh, and then usually the, the greedy algorithms they usually stop there at the moment that they see a better solution, but we wanted um, uh, an algorithm that do a guided research as opposed to uh, doing um, uh, as opposed to doing a greedy search uh, with the and, and ant colony is, is one of the best candidates and 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 if you look at the the history of the ant colony and the literature um, there are a lot of research published for the ant colony that they have been using this and they have been getting a lot of good um, uh, good um, uh, answers the problems that they have not been solving before. So 
that portion having having multiple local minimum uh, it pushed us to a some sort of a meta heuristic uh, solution got it so we had another question um, from d now if d has uh, a mic uh, you are now uh, able to talk to the group so would you like to ask your question d and that was around how you calculated the value of the wells sure if you can hear me we can um, so my my question uh, initially was really about um, in your algorithm uh, you sort of have probably a bunch of variables that are defining a value uh, in terms of a concept so what are you actually using in the underlying variables um, and then I guess my follow-on question would be I'm curious about what the field teams have said uh, about this algorithm because it seems like it's assuming that uh, one member of the ops team is going to be able to perform all of the functions for the well versus in reality, um, maybe um, the algorithm should be focused more on the functionality of failure uh, in terms of optimizing for particular vehicles. So, okay. It's, it's, it's a good, good question. Um, so let's, let's start with, the, with this slide here. Um, I have these wells uh, color coded. And so we see the we see the red, we see uh, dark blue, and uh, we see these black ones. This color code here uh, means that there is one operator in, in one in each day. There is one operator in charge of this area. Uh, they, they call it an area or function group. So there is one operator in charge of all these red wells. And the operator is um, basically looks after all these wells. If they are fail, the failure has to be fixed by the operator. And if they are a scheduled visit, uh, it has to be uh, fixed by them, by this uh, operator. Uh, so that's why, um, that's why the algorithm is creating one schedule for each operator. And in terms of in terms of the type of the work that operators do, uh, from my understanding from the org client is that operators are are basically the first responders. If the fail well, if a well fails, operators go there and visit that, and that's that's always that's always the way that uh, things are done. And then once they go and visit, if there is something that they can fix themselves they fix it right away. But if it's something that is required more work, then they will call the corresponding unit uh, to come and, uh, and then join and then do, do the task. Uh, so that's, uh, um, that's, uh, basically, um, uh, that's basically how we design this algorithm for our client needs. Uh, but that's, that's the way that they are doing uh, business. So this is in terms of the type of work and why we are designing a schedule for the operator. Now, in, in terms of the, 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 uh, the variable, uh, so the way that this algorithm works, um, it comes up, uh, let me go back here, yes. So it comes up with a bunch of low combinations that the operator has to visit per day and so, the, or, optimiza or optimization variable, as I said earlier, is a bunch of ones and zeros. If it assigns one to each of these wells, that means uh, the well is going to be visited today. And these, um, these wells that are selected, the combination of these wells, we make sure that the, in terms of the driving time and in terms of the value that it brings to the, uh, to the, to the client, at the end of the day, it has the highest possible value. The wells that have been fixed, there is a production rate associated to each well. And at the same time, we make sure that the wells with the highest production come back to the, come back to the basically uh, being active again, uh, while we take care of the task duration and the driving time. Uh, I, I don't know, I hope this answers your, your question in terms of the, uh, the uh, the underlying parameters there. Yeah, thanks for the question, Dean. 
so there's two questions that I'm going to roll into one, and uh, that's around how much effort was this? So Evan says this looked like a huge amount of effort. How many people were working on the project and how long did it take, if you could answer that? And then maybe the second part I'm going to tack on is uh, what internal IBM tools were used to help, uh, perhaps because of those tools, it took less time than this uh, person uh, thinks it would have. Yeah. Yes. Um... It was a lot of work, uh, for sure, uh, creating those um, maps data. It was it's a lot of work. Um, then um, another part of this that uh, I would I'd like to quickly go through this uh, is basically the, the algorithm that we use for solving this main optimization problem, which is basically um, picking the wells. What algorithm that we use and the modifications that we did to this algorithm. So we use a binary differential evolution algorithm here. A differential algorithm is usually, is, is a modified version of the genetic algorithm that you create, I'm just gonna quickly go through this, that you create um, a bunch of uh, random initial population. And then out of that initial population, then uh, you pick three random and do a linear combination of them, which we call them, um, uh, we, we call that mutation. Now this has been designed for continuous problem. That means um, the, 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 the number that is generated, it could be 0 0.3, 0 0.2. And this is basically a, a potential solution. Uh, now we don't need that or we can work with this or potential solution should be a bunch of zeros and ones. Um, what we did here, uh, we, we used um, binary mutation, which is basically a combination of and or an X or R between the, uh, between the, uh, between the candidate solutions or between the initial population. Initial population could be a bunch of ones and zeros. This part itself um, <clears throat> it took a long time. Um, we, we, needed, we needed a metaheuristic optimization solution, but we wanted that to work binary. So this portion of this algorithm, they took a long time. Uh, I think um, in terms of time, we have been working on this for almost five months, if I'm not mistaken. Understanding the client needs and um, basically formulating that, it was a huge part, analyzing the data, identifying the opportunities. Um, uh, we, have a, we have a team of, uh, of uh, two data scientists and one developer working on this, uh, plus the project manager and the project lead. And um, in, terms of the, in terms of the IBM tools, uh, we have not been using any IBM tools for this phase of the project, uh, but uh, the, for the next phases of the project, um, we, we, may, we may use uh, IBM tools. Uh, everything here was uh, developed from scratch uh, because as you see here, uh, a lot of work had to be, um, had to be tailored to the, to the client's needs. And this is one example here that I want to share. Thank you. So I think I'll, we'll go through two more quick questions and then we'll move to Yannick. We're getting close to the top of the hour uh, and our second topic. So the, there's a question here uh, by William. And William, uh, you also have the ability to speak to the group. Uh, if you are listening, uh, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, I'll, re I'll read your question. Hi, this is William. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my question was related to that slide with the uh, scheduled and, and non-scheduled tasks. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, it was the bar graph with the black and uh, red bars. I see, okay. Yes, this one. Um, I was just wondering, so you mentioned that like, uh, it would be better if um, we could move some of the scheduled tasks to the lighter days. Um, but how would you know uh, that those days don't have a, a failure happen? Great question, great question. So we receive a report of all the failures at early morning. It could be five or 6 a.m. 
So we we receive uh, the report of everything that has been failed by five or six a.m. and then uh, that report, the output of that goes to our algorithm, and based on that, the algorithm creates a schedule for for the day. And so by that time, if there is any well failed, then um, it's gonna go to the algorithm, and the algorithm will make sure that they are top priority. But if there is no failure by, by 5 or 6 a.m., uh, then, the, then it's going to be, that day is going to be assigned to the most of the scheduled uh, tasks. Now, I must acknowledge here that this is for the first phase of the project. And uh, now for the next phase of the project, you're planning to run this algorithm multiple times per day. That means we run that in the early morning. If there is any failure, it's going to be captured by the algorithm. It's going to be planned. And then the, we're going to run this algorithm once again at, at, at lunchtime. And if there has been any failure between morning and lunchtime, then it's going to be captured and then uh, create an immediate uh, plan to visit them for the rest of the day. Yeah. All right. Thank you. That answers my question. Thanks, William. Okay, uh, so the last question uh, is about getting the actuals from the wells themselves. And there were actually two folks who asked this in different ways, but in uh, a future world, um, sort of based on the findings from this project, you know, would this dovetail into a scenario where you're actually, you've actually got sensors downhole or otherwise that would uh, inform the, the, uh, the operators day to day activities? Um, so, so currently, um, I, I believe uh, most of these uh, productions of the wells are monitored by the sensors, and this is how they get. Um, the, this is how the, the client uh, gets um, warning in the morning whether a well has been failed or not. Um, bunch of other sensors that have been installed or are being installed that help us to understand uh, uh, the, the nature of the failure. And from there, we can have a better understanding of type of failure that has been happening. So I, I guess this is a, this is a um, evolving process and, and everything here gets better uh, with, with, with time. Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sohil. This was uh, great. Lots of great questions too. Um, so if you uh, stop sharing, we'll transition over to Yannick from WestJet. And if you uh, just joined or if you missed the introduction uh, at the beginning, uh, we would love to use the Slack throughout the month, uh, not only to gather your questions for Yannick, but just to interact with me and with each other. And so if you uh, missed the, the uh, instructions, you can just go to calgary.ai or go to the meetup. And on the homepage of the meetup, there is a link to join the Slack channel. And uh, just for, um, for good measure, I'm gonna put that right on the event detail page itself, right at the top. Um, so if you were to go to that page and refresh, you would see that. Um, because I think that's a great way to stay in touch because the reality is, unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna be meeting in person anytime soon. But uh, it is what it is. So thank you, Sohil. And uh, over to you, Yannick. Yannick you. Uh, from WestJet. Yep. Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Me? Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, just want to thank you, everyone, to join. Uh, the AI meetup uh, via Zoom today, and thank to Drew and, and Lyndon for, for organizing. Um, I'm going to start with a brief introduction about myself. Uh, I have a background in aerospace engineering. I've been working for uh, airlines for the last six years, and most specifically in data science and, and revenue management. Um, I'm actually from Spain, and I moved to Calgary two and a half years ago. Uh, to start working for WestJet, where I'm actually uh, now in the in the revenue management um, analytics uh, team. Um, so I have a kind of like a different presentation today. It's not that 
technical uh, as we've seen some, some from Sahil. Um, it's more about our journey um, in data science and how we got there and what are we doing in the pricing and revenue management field uh, in that sense uh, to take advantage of, of all, the, all the options that, that this is giving us. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a brief introduction, then just go through some basic of what pricing and revenue management is, what is our goal and, and what do we do? Um, how do we support that through uh, analytics? And then I will go through a, a, a short uh, data science project in specific, and then go through uh, partnerships that, that we're leveraging to, to get there. Um, so first of all, I just want to introduce Wesia to everyone. I mean, everyone is pretty familiar with it, but uh, we fly basically from Canada, domestic Canada, and then to Europe, United States, and, and the Caribbean. Basically, just to like give a sense of the size of the company, we factor over like around $5 billion a year, and we carry uh, 25 million passengers. And it was founded in 1996. Um, I just want to take a second to, to show you guys a, a video um, about Wedget, just a minute long. This is a story for the ones who fly in the face of convention. For everyone who decided to go their own route, every challenger, every dark horse. Because like they say, fortune favors the bold. Here, we've always charted our own path, a little west of center, if you will. No, we've never been much for the status quo. And the truth is, no matter where you're headed, whatever the journey, there will always be the naysayers, the competition, those who want to see you fall. Well, we want to see you soar. So to anyone who believed in themselves when no one else did, everyone who believes in where they're going, there's a lot of runway ahead of us. Welcome aboard. The new West Chat. West Chat. Love where you're going. I look forward to the day that WestJet can fly me to Costa Rica, where I was supposed to go in two weeks again. Yeah, that was that was where I, where I was going to. Uh, so, yeah, it's a very difficult time, like through the all the COVID uh, um, times that we're having, and the air air travel demand is like really affected for it. So, I just wanted to like take a moment to recognize all the all our our crew and the frontline staff that that is doing a, a really good job. To bringing all the Canadians home and, and like uh, just showing the our our brand and our our caring caring side and hopefully you'll be able to go to Costa Rica soon. Um, so Wizard is a big organization. Um, so I just want to um, point where revenue management pricing is and and where what's the what's the role in that. So we're within the commercial area. We can find different groups. The digital group, which take care of the of the website basically, then marketing, which is brand and, and advertising, uh, the loyalty team that, that um, takes care of our, our loyalty program and loyalty guests. Uh, then we have the network uh, planning and, and alliances a team, which basically decides where we are going to fly. And lastly, we have the revenue management and pricing team that uh, manage all the, all the revenue. And basically the main goal is to, to set, the, the prices of the, set the prices of the flights. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about like what revenue management and pricing is more, more in depth. Uh, but our main goal, as I said, is to show the price, uh, to the customer, uh, in the website in order to maximize the, the revenues that, the, that the company is having. So I'm going to go through like what pieces are taking into account to like set those prices and basically which levers do we have, uh, to, to do so. So basically, the, the concept of revenue management, it's what enable airlines to sell the right product uh, to, the right, sorry, to the right customer at the right time for the right price to increase our, our revenues. So what we're looking at is how is the, the demand, basically, and, and how we can, we can leverage that to optimize the, the fares that, that, we, that we offer and to, to, have, uh, to maximize our revenues. So pretty straightforward is like a supply and demand uh, law. 
So as higher is the price, less demand will have, and lower is the price, more demand will have. So we, we have to like basically play with the price to be able to, to capture the right amount of demand that, that we need for, for every flight. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance between the, the, the price and the customers that, that are going to, to purchase. So we can have extremely high fares because no one would buy, obviously, and we can have low, like, uh, low fare um, because we would just like sell out all the, all the planes uh, instantly and we, we won't be able to fly anymore, probably. So it's like neither of them work. In some cases, some of them work, but basically we have to like find a balance uh, between both. So how do we do that? Is basically we have two levers that we play with. The first one is inventory management. So the airline, every airline need to kind of like artificially differentiate the seats that are within uh, a plane and give them each of them a price point for the demand that they think that we're gonna sell um, those fares. So then there's some controls established in this inventory management in which we save some amount of seats for every price point, depending on the demand that we're forecasting to get uh, at, every, at every fare. Those, those, uh, this, this inventory is classified in what we call fare classes that are in a hierarchical order. They go from the lowest for class A in this case to the highest for class K. Um, and each one is associated with one price point that uh, we at the end are gonna give a value to. But the inventory uh, management analysts are basically looking at how much demand we are receiving for a fair class in order to be able to optimize that. <laughs> So if you were to look at a flight, um, normally like, there's different guests that have paid different prices, and that's because they bought at a different time, they bought to fly um, at a different day. Um, but basically it's like the time of, of, of purchase that, that uh, drive um, that fare. So the second lever that we have, it's the, the pricing lever, and it's where we assign a price point to every one of those fare classes. And this price point is very uh, different depending on the market that we're looking. So for example, if we fly Calgary, Vancouver, the price point will be the same than a Calgary, London in the UK, uh, obviously for the distance of the route. The price point also depends on the season, on the day of week, uh, and a lot of like different factors that are in play in there. And those are our, our pricing uh, levers. Then in order to, uh, for a seat to be available in our website, we need both the inventory available and the pricing to be assigned uh, on that for the, for the flight that we, that we are looking at. So it's a combination of both, which gives us um, this, this fare available. So those are pretty much the two levers that our revenue management and pricing teams are using in order to, to, pr to price the flights and, and um, being able to, to sell them. Then uh, we in Revenue Analytics basically manage all the data that's behind all those decisions that they make and all those changes that they are made daily. So our vision basically is, uh, and our mission is like to enrich the pricing and revenue management uh, analyst uh, through high data quality and having that in a timely manner. Uh, explore new data sources to provide them with new information to be able to make faster and better uh, decisions. Create uh, reports and dashboards for them in order to make those decisions. And then support and, and train them in the tools that, that we are gonna use. And then most importantly, the last two points, uh, implementing automation. So being able to automate processes so that they can focus on real analysis and not in doing uh, manual work. And then bringing data science into the revenue management field, uh, which has shown to have a very high value uh, with, with the last uh, years in general in the, in the industry. And not just like in, in revenue management, but, but in general. So that's, that's a little bit the, the analytics curve where like a lot of companies go through and which Wejet is, is an example also. 
So everything starts with like, oh my God, we have a lot of data and we have a problem to solve, right? And then uh, someone comes to ask you some questions and you do some ad hoc researches on the data and you find some answers for them. Then when those questions become to be more uh, periodical, um, basically we build reports for that so that instead of like coming with us, with coming to us with questions every time, they can just like self-serve uh, through reporting and be able to answer uh, those questions by themselves. And the, the point where we are right now, it's going into predictive analytics and is instead of waiting for the questions, we own all the data and we know what's in there. So we're going to basically find uh, things that, that we see or patterns that we see of things that can be uh, enhanced or do better to then go to the leadership team and, and tell them uh, where, where to focus uh, those, those efforts. So some of the tools that we use to do that uh, in terms of data storage, we are now, uh, we have SQL Server and Oracle in-prem and we're uh, moving all the data to the cloud uh, through Microsoft Azure. Uh, obviously, we still stuck with Excel and some, and some of the stuff, but we are uh, trying to move away uh, from that as much as we can. Then for data processing, we're basically using Alteryx within the, the revenue analytics team. Uh, which is a really good tool uh, of drag and drop, uh, easy coding and very easy training uh, for the analysts in general. And we use that for basically for data cleansing and data transformation. Uh, we also can uh, schedule all the workflows to run periodically and to have all the data uh, updated that we need. And it also has some capabilities of predictive analytics that are linked with uh, R, which we also use separately uh, to do data modeling and, and some statistical analysis. So in terms of visualizations, we mainly use uh, Tableau and another in-house uh, tool that's very revenue management specific, but I'll focus on Tableau. Um, so is our main visualization tool. Uh, we can do like very good and quick visualizations for data science uh, related projects and just like to show any data uh, in general. So it has a good uh, integration with Alteryx, uh, which we use to like transform the data and then feed into a, into the data sources. Um, everyone in the team can access it through the through the Tableau uh, server and pretty much anyone in the company, as it's a, an, an enterprise uh, wide solution. Um, it also have a lot of like a big community for for support, and and we we are very active in the Calgary uh, Tableau user groups and and meetups as well. So this is an example of like how we, we would build like a report or, or a, a, um, a tool for the analyst is basically querying the data from our data sources, putting that through Alteryx uh, to data transformation, data prep, and then uh, putting that into Tableau for data visualization. Uh, I'm gonna go through one of the projects that, that we've done recently in, in data science. We have a lot, a lot of, we have different projects, but is uh, it's a little bit uh, confidentiality sensitive of like all the information that we can show. So that's why I've choose like this one in, in, in specific. So basically um, within this project, the goal is to create an algorithm to detect the flight exceptions and help the revenue management analysts that are uh, managing the flights every day to identify them. So we use two main KPIs uh, in revenue management, which are the load factor. So basically it measures uh, the utilization of the plane. So how full it is. It's the number of passengers divided by the capacity of the plane. And then the average fare, which is basically the total revenue that we get uh, to fly that plane divided by the number of, of passengers that, that fly it. And then here below, we can see a load factor graph, which is basically depending on the days so the X axis is the days to departure of the flight and the Y axis is the load factor of the flight. So we can see that this one, for example, at like 160 days out, which is approximately five months out, um, the load factor is close to 10%. And then as the date of departure comes in, uh, the, the flight is, is filling, filling up. So in order to, in order to, um, to group those flights, 
to be able to see which ones are performing in the same way and being able to help the analyst on how to action them in the future. Uh, we will run a clustering algorithm to be able to, to uh, group them together. So the first step is standardizing the data and the two variables that we're using here is load factor in the X axis and average fare in the Y axis. Uh, the first thing we do is take out the outliers. Uh, there are sometimes some flights that are just um, outliers because they have like irregular operations or they've been like canceled for weather, uh, but, but they still uh, in our data. So first thing we have to filter all out and then we've got this picture here that is pretty standardized average fares and, and low factors. Uh, then we will apply a k-means clustering to, to this uh, data set. Um, and to choose the number of k's, we use the elbow methodology, which is basically running the k-mean clustering um, about yeah, x number of times and being able where the, where the curve starts uh, flattening down. Um, This, the number of case is, busy, is mostly uh, related to the number of frequencies that the market has. So if a market is like very high frequency and we fly 15 times a day, for example, it will have a lot of clusters. And if it's a like low frequency market where we fly one times a week, we won't have a lot of observations and then we'll have a very low amount of clusters. So this is a pretty high frequency uh, market, but basically we run the, the K-means clustering with seven clusters in this case. And we can see that in orange, we've clustered together all the flights that are low load factor and low average fare, so that the analyst can focus in improving those flights. Probably by, if we would lower the price a little bit on those ones, the load factor would go up and we'll probably get more revenue out of that. And I'll, we can also see the cluster number one, which is the blue one, which is very high load factor flights between like 70 and, and 100% and very high fares. So in these ones here, probably we have an opportunity to raise a little bit the fares and we would still have uh, good load factors on those flights so that the analyst can, can take um, those actions. So the last step we take is we do averages uh, for every one of the clusters to know what is the load factor curve or that cluster. So this here would be the load factor curve average of one of the clusters. And then when, we, when a flight is building up and we can see how is it performing. If it's in the region that it's in the middle, is that the flight is performing on the average like its cluster is, right? And if it's going sideways up here, it means that it's overperforming. And if it's going down here, it means that it's underperforming. So that the analyst can overlap the, flat, the actual real flight performance with the average of their, of their clusters to be able to, to make decisions um, based on that. So um, lastly, I wanna, I wanna touch a little bit the, the different partnerships uh, that we have. So, the, the data science team in, in revenue management specifically, it's been growing for the last two or three years, uh, but still we still have um, not a lot of, of resources at this point. So we leverage a lot of like external partnerships to be able to, to move uh, more projects forward. So the, the first partnership that, the first type of partnership, let's say that we use, it's uh, collaborating with uh, universities. We have some uh, PhD researchers that are doing uh, some collaboration with us. Uh, in terms of like uh, PhD uh, thesis, then some MBA capstone projects that are also uh, collaborating with us, as well as some uh, um, bachelor and master students that that come in uh, into WestJet for a for a summer um, internship. Then we also work with uh, artificial intelligence focus companies to do POCs. Uh, basically, we do a small proof of concepts uh, to see if. Uh, if models or if uh, showcases are working to then be able to move uh, forward uh, with, with them. Um, this is more specifically uh, related to the digital team with I guess uh, Fabio uh, will we'll present more about that in the, in the next uh, AI meetup. Um, and then we also um, work with uh, third party vendors um, with their data science team. In our case, we, we get, for example, 
competitor's data from all the different airlines that, that we compete against from a vendor. And they also have a lot of like data science knowledge uh, related to that data that partnering with them were able to, to, to bring more, more value uh, to both companies as well as events data. So, um, I mean, flight, flight in general and like air travel demand is very driven by events sometimes. So we also partner with uh, an external vendor that provides us uh, event data to be able to, uh, to uh, predict better how to, to price our flights. Um, and then lastly, there's a big um, community in the airline uh, industry related to operation research and more general in, in data science. So we have annual conferences where uh, there's a study groups, the study group that is, uh, it also incorporates an, an MIT um, department of research that is specifically to, to revenue management uh, in airlines. And then a different, a lot of different airlines uh, within uh, around the world, let's say that have their their own uh, data science team, and that we were able to to partner together. Thank you very much, and I'll leave that open for questions. Thanks, Yanni. I just wanted to reinforce too. I was thinking while you were wrapping up there that the content uh, that you presented is. Um, perfect for a lot of members of this group. So I think you'd you kind of had hedged a little bit when you first started presenting, uh, and um, you know the the technical content that IBM presented. Of course, uh, it's a little bit of a different presentation, but it is pretty intentional. It's very intentional actually to sort of offset the technical content that we provide with uh, content that uh, is a lot more approachable and speaks more to the business impact of commercializing the technologies that we talk about. So no need to, um, you know, to, to uh, hedge at all. There are many, many people in the audience who uh, come here for exactly that. And I know in the uh, physical meetup, there's lots of conversations that get started about topics that I think a lot of us might be comfortable with, but um, we forget that most others aren't. So I think that was really, really good. So there were a couple questions um, and I think uh, you did, cover one of them already. I think someone had asked, do you include competitive information from other carriers? And I think I just heard that the answer to that is yes, you rely on a, you know, a vendor who provides that. Anything you can elaborate on there? Uh, so we, we use competitors information. It's just that basically uh, our baseline is our demand. So the, the main baseline that we follow is supply and demand offer, right? And then why the demand is not coming in, that can be for different cases. One of them can be because of the competitors. And then it's why we rely on the, on basically the demand information and forecast that we have. And on top of that, we add some other layers, which one of them is the, is the competitors information, of course, that the analysts are, are looking at, the, at the daily, on a daily basis. Got it. So a uh, couple of questions. Let me just, questions coming in a variety of screens here. So, um, there's a question here uh, that I, um, you know, I think we'll, Alan will save the question. We'll save Yannick the question. I think WestJet's going through a pretty t challenging time, and I, I don't think Yannick's probably the best person to talk about the strategy about WestJet's price differentiation. So I just want to acknowledge the question, but I just, um, I don't think that that's necessarily something that Yannick uh, is able to speak to. Um, but Yannick, what you could speak to is, I think many others in the audience are probably wondering this too. Alteryx, uh, it's a tool I'm familiar with. Um, a couple of us have probably used it. Uh, Tamer here says, have you found challenges with maintainability of your workflows? Uh, I, think, I think that the biggest challenge that we started encountering is when we start adding more and more data. So it's very good when you use uh, small to medium data sets. Um, but then when you move to like very big data sets, it kind of like uh, start going a little slow in performance. That's one of the things that we found. Uh, in terms of man maintaining the workflows, um, we have a pretty good methodology of moving the workflows to production and keeping them in the lab if we're not using them yet. So I think we do a pretty good job there. Um, the only thing I would say is that having the server license, which we don't have yet, would help a lot. Um, 
on that sense, but we it, it's not an enterprise solution for the moment. We're only using it in, in, in our team. So um, it's not something that we're gonna do right now. But yeah, I would say, just to answer the question, maintaining the workflows, if you like still ha have a, a, a process to like kind of like the different steps that, that the workflow is, and when it's into production, don't touch it. And if you do uh, be knowledgeable of the changes that, that you do, then I think it's, it, it's fine. So there's some questions about the fleet. Uh, I'll roll two of these into one. So Mark asks, has the grounding of specific models of planes recently shifted your approach to optimization? And this is in some ways related. Alistair is wondering, um, do you do work on fleet management and fuel optimization? Which of course, the you know the model of the plane factors in heavily around predicting work that would need to be done. Yep. So, um, well, the so the network planning, um, network planning, uh, team does the, the fleet optimization and basically decided which type of planes do we fly to each destination. Obviously, one of their inputs that they use is our data. So how are the flights performing in, in every case? Um, but basically, they made the decision. And then in terms of fuel efficiency, that's totally into the operational side. And we don't have any, any, any side on that. And uh, just answering the questions about the groundings. so. As I said, we play a lot with the supply and demand. Um, and basically our supply is our capacity, right? The number of seats that we have available to sell. So um, grounding airplanes means having less seats. So obviously like this affects uh, in one way or, or another uh, on the way that, that, that we're doing our job. Mm -hmm. I think this is an interesting one. Um, do you have some sense of the impact that this work has had on WestJet in terms of the just the in, the business outcomes? So this was from Will. Do you have any broad metrics related to the impact uh, of your work? None that I can share. Um, but we've we so we've seen a lot of of improvement just bringing uh, data science in and and doing some projects in the in that field related to to revenue management we've been able to like optimize a lot of processes and you can you can quantify also the work that we're doing in like freeing up analyst time so that they're able to like focus uh, on their job or directly in like automating um automating processes that they're like bringing direct uh revenue impact Sorry, I, I don't have like any numbers or specific metrics. Uh, uh, very understandable, but directionally, it sounds like it's uh, making a difference. Um, so I wondered this as you were talking as well, and, and uh, as you were talking about just the practice of revenue management as a simple optimization exercise. And I think a lot of us probably felt what I felt, which is, well, how do you deal with, how do, how do you account for that intangible, you know, the nature of treating the customer well and optimizing for that far future purchase that might not be the immediate uh, naive optimization. So, you know, Lindsay asked this, do you look at all, all, all at customer satisfaction kind of over the long term, or other sort of intangible value for different routes and different fares paid? And then um, someone else had asked something similar. Um, Iyer, who'd asked, how do you account for overbooking of flights, which kind of gets at the same topic, right? How do you deal with the long-term optimization versus the short-term? So first, first of all, I just want to say that WestJet do not overbook, so we don't oversell any airplane. Uh, it's one of our, our policies, uh, and it's a very common practice in the airline industry to oversell seats because you have like a lot of, of no-shows, but it's something that, that WestJet doesn't do. So that's one of the things that like we for sure do for, for customer. Uh, satisfaction and it means that like if you buy a flight with WestJet, uh, basically you're not gonna be left out uh, at the gate uh, for overbooking. Um, and then in terms of, of customer satisfaction, uh, I would say that uh, we kind of like set the baseline for the prices, but then our loyalty team and um, marketing team also like get a play in that as well. And they have different levers that they can uh, pull uh, to be able to focus more 
on the on the customer satisfaction depending on the on the segment that that it's buying okay i think um I've got a couple more questions here. I think we'll go to uh, we'll go to seven thirty with questions. Just a few more, and then I was thinking, as well, uh, if folks want to hang on the line, I can promote uh, participants to attendees as well. So I'd be happy to chat. I think a lot of us would probably love to kind of see some more people face to face, or at least screen to screen. Um, so, but let's take a few more questions before we do that. Let me just catch up on the Zoom questions. So, Omalada, you had a question, and since you've got the mic, do you want to just ask it directly? Sure. Uh, uh, thanks again, Yanni. That was a really great um, presentation. And I know uh, your demand forecast actually fits into your uh, revenue uh, management system. Uh, my question is, how much uh, I mean, have you seen um, your, I mean, the influence of, say, other external data having on your demand I mean, forecasting, like the outliers that you couldn't capture uh, using your, say, maybe your customer, your booking, your competitor data? Uh, I know you mentioned like events, like I mean, local events that maybe your destination and where you're flying from, uh, and I mean maybe some other I mean things like the local economy and weather and like travel advisory. How much influence or differentiation have you seen these uh, adding to your demand forecast accuracy as against your just using your internal and uh, competitor I mean, data? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, so we have a revenue management system that basically has a forecasting model, an optimization model uh, built in it. And it only takes into account uh, basically demand that, that we've seen from the system without taking into account any of the external factors. Um, and then that's our baseline for that. And then on top of that, uh, we uh, add all this external data to be able to make decisions and basically influence uh, that baseline forecast that is giving us. Um, so today we we only we we don't use like macroeconomics or like weather, uh, uh, for example, data. We only use uh, events data, competitors data um, about prices and also about capacity. So capacity number of like seats that are offering market for us and for the competitors. It's a very important variable. Um, and then also prices of, of the competitor, right? And then holidays. Um, that's not built in the revenue management system, but I would say that on, on the last slide, uh, I had uh, um, this like airlines around the world, um, let's say user groups and, and conferences that we do. And this is a topic that's coming up every time, more and more, to be able to incorporate all this macroeconomic, um, macroeconomic, um, variables let's say into the revenue management system so that it takes in, that into account um for the for the final forecasting of the demand well i think we'll end with one last question and uh sure. there'll be a bit of levity here so mark wants to know yannick how do i get the best price for a flight <laughs> yeah that's that's the question um Honestly, even like it, it, it's very hard to tell because it's a very dynamic, uh, it's a very dynamic environment. There's a lot of, of variable of external external variables that that are taken into account, and the analysts are adjusting pretty much on a daily basis uh, based on the on the supply, demand, and external factors that that they're playing into account. So it's it's very hard to tell uh, when is exactly the the best the best time. Or when the lowest price will be available. Yeah. Right on. Well, thank you so much, Yannick, and thanks again to uh, Sohil as well. I really appreciate both of your presentations. And um, as I said, I, I'm going to keep the the I'm going to stop the recording now. Um,